Captain. Incoming message. It was the dawn of the third age of mankind. Groovy. Hi ho. Uh, this is me, Kermit the Frog. Hello there. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Not a great plan. Oh, for crying out loud. Program complete. Enter when ready. Let's see what's out there. A game. Hey there, we're those sci-fi guys, and this is that those sci-fi guys show. Just two working dudes, just different lives, different jobs, but a whole lot of love for science fiction and the fun that comes with. We are your hosts. I am P.S. McKay, and my fearless partner over here might have noticed the change in the opening, thanks to a suggestion from these sci-fi guys. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a huge fan. It's like five seconds. I know, it just... It's five seconds. It's five it, seconds. It, 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 but it, it's... Stop interrupting. What we... Most of the other things are more iconic. Yeah, that, that's iconic among Stargate fans. Uh, There's literally a five-minute clip I'm of... sorry. O'Neill yeah. saying, for crying out loud. <laughs> over and over again throughout the series of ten years. Uh, it's not iconic to you. But guess who edits the drops? This guy. Eh. Eh. <laughs> How are you, DT? Uh, I'm good. Nice to be back in the swing of things here, potting. We do take casting. an innumerable, an, an innumerable amount of like lengths of breaks. I, I actually don't mind it in the sense that it's, it, I, it's not actually that long considering our our last uh, special one was just only over a little over a week ago that's true and it was a special during the the, the middle of the hiatus the, the two-week hiatus that we take yeah every month <laughs> let's not forget so. we have something coming that's in a similar spot too I teased it a little bit, and that's all I'm going to say about it. But yeah, we got a big, uh, we got a big event. All I'm going to say more is we got a crossover coming, everybody. With whom? With what? Don't know yet. You don't. I do. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. You know. To, yeah. To quote George Takai, I read. I read. <laughs> oh, I don't have my drops open. It's a shame. Oh, well, too late. Uh, so what you're saying is you dropped the ball. I dropped the ball on the drops. I did. I did do that. So oh my. It happens. What am I going to do? <laughs> so how was your uh, how was your weekend, your time off? Everything going good? Well, no time off. Um, well, time off from we, the pod, but yeah. We Weekend was a bit of a cluster. Uh, I was on call for work on on Saturday morning, and oh my, I'm rushed. That yeah, sucks, exactly. Dude. That sucks. Oh uh, yeah. Normally, I, I we got it usually at least one a month, but if I don't have to go into the office, it's not terrible. We're usually not running full strength, right? You know, when I am on call, but I had to go into the office because somebody hit something. <laughs> so I had to go out there and check uh. it out. Damn. Yes. Uh, so, okay. Yeah, so through someone else's incompetence, you have to go. I wouldn't say it's clean incompetence, up. but it was definitely distract neglect. distraction. Neglect. That's my entire world, neglect. <laughs> Professionally and personally. So, <laughs> Well, were you able to salvage your Sunday at all, at least? Have a nice time with the fam. Yeah. Good. Gathered gathered up the wife, the kid, my parents, and we drove down to the Cape. Weather was decent, but we also wanted to check out a house where we're all getting this summer. Oh, to uh, for what for like a week or something? Yep. Nice. Like you, you and the whole fam. Yep. 
That's seven. That's gonna be awesome. Good, good, nice. That's gonna be great. Agreed. I, I, I'm looking forward to that for you. That's gonna be fun. We are too. We haven't spent much time down there since we moved back, and you know we like it. Are we talking about mm, uh, an area? Oh, the Cape. The Cape. I'm sorry. I was gonna like do a more illusion. Like I, I didn't hear the Cape. I heard beach. I don't know why. I don't, yeah. But the mm, Cape. Yeah, I'm already disappointing you this early on. So. Um, oh, you've never stopped, my friend. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I'll anyway. tell you what I did do this week. What's that? And it can kind of, it, it might actually blend it a little into our topic. I bought digitally the first season of House of the Dragon. Yes. And it's, what'd you think? It was, you said it was on your mind. Well, yeah, I'm not done with, I'm not done with it. And I actually, mm-hmm. I actually read Fire and Blood, and okay. like any any George R. R. Martin product, it's not finished. <laughs> so wait, is Fire and Blood a prequel? Fire and, that's, and is Blood that what the is whole basically the chrono the, the chronology of the Targaryen uh, reign from Aegon conquest of the Seven Kingdoms. All the way up to I, the Mad King at the start of the series. Uh, How long is that era? Uh, a little shy of 300 years. It's a bold strategy to start like a, a chronology novel when you haven't <clears throat> finished the main storyline. Well, the funny part is <laughs> Fire and Blood is only 50% done. <laughs> it's supposed to be a duology. <laughs> oh, George, he's never going to disappoint in disappointing. <laughs> uh, so I actually read this. Now, I did read the book, A Game of Thrones, but it was after I watched the first five or six seasons. Um, anyway, so uh, it I was... I have the... I have pretty much the whole series, like, except for that last book that's not going to ever be written. It's going to be ghost written. Um, you know this. But I haven't I haven't wanted to actually start it because I know that the last book hasn't been written. Damn it. So. Oh, <laughs> uh, what? What? Oh, yours or. No, George R. no. R. George R. R. Martin's. My book, my last book's going to be written. I just figured it out. I had the breakthrough today. I'm going to be writing that shit pretty soon. Took me six months to try to, after finishing the the first draft of the last book, but right. I'm not George R. R. Martin. So, <laughs> so George R. R. Martin wrote Fire and Blood. It came out in November of 2018. I read it on my second tour of Saudi in 2020. Um, I had just finished watching all of Game of Thrones. I've I've read all the published Duncan Egg uh, novellas. I've read Fire and Blood. I have the Oral Device and Fire coffee table book, which is fantastic. But I've only read A A Game of Thrones. I haven't read any of the other four books. I read A Game of Thrones after I had watched the first five seasons of the show Game of Thrones. Um, I found it in a desk in my office in Afghanistan. And it looked like a pretty brand new book. Mm. So I, I read it. Came out and like ninety five or something. The the first novel, you can follow a good chunk of this first season along with the novel. It's pretty yeah. closely tied. So, but I enjoyed Fire and Blood because uh, they it, it rather than a novel, Fire and Blood takes the form of a scholarly treatise about the Targaryen dynasty written by a historian. Uh, And there's also some other sources. It's, 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 it's fun. He's writing in like, like second person and stuff like that. 
Okay. Uh, I hate that. But if it's meant to be like a treatise, I can deal with that. It is. It is. It's supposed to be written by a maester. Yeah. There's, written- there's excerpts <sighs> from works of Septons and diaries and accounts from other people. So it's it's almost like a a bit of a textbook in some ways. Yeah, no, I can, I can, I can see that. I mean, uh, I see, I come across short stories that are, that are written in second person, and I don't know why people think that's a good idea. It's terrible. Well, it wasn't World War Z written like a survival guide? It was not. It was written as a, um, uh, did you ever read it? You didn't read it. No, I don't no, like it's, zombies. It's actually very well done. I'm not a big zombie fan either, but I couldn't put the damn book down. It's actually written from the point of view of a a, a journalist who is not a journalist. I'm sorry. He's um he's a UN. Oh God, what do you call him? I don't know. A UN a UN officer. Peacekeeper. The, not peacekeeper, but he's chronicling uh different major civilian moments during the zombie outbreak. And so he goes to different people and each chapter is an interview with what specific person and what their experience was during the zombie outbreak. So like a historian. Yeah. Yeah. Like an official historian. He did a book. He did like at the beginning of the book, he mentions that he did the work for the UN and he gave his report, his chronological report, to his boss and his boss is like this is fine and he walked away and i think he was like feeling very unsatisfied with that report so he decided to write his own book um based off of his interviews it's actually pretty well done i i, I again i'm not a zombie person i'm not a horror fan well that's mad this was Brooks. this was a good book this was a good book i hear it 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 really picked up in the second half when there was all sorts of yiddish jokes um i don't know that (laughs) i can't speak for that i can't a lot and a lot of cheap shots at hitler i i can't speak for that either it's been 11 years since i've read it but i will say this do you get the pun do you get the joke i do i get it because his father is is um uh the other brooks that 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 did springtime for hitler (laughs) yeah. <laughs> Mel Brooks' son Max wrote yes. this, which I think yes. is pretty fascinating. Proves that creativity yeah. is in the family. And and in very different ways, by the way. But it's there. And it, it, it was a good book. It actually I started to reread it the be at the beginning of the COVID epidemic. And I don't recommend reading that book during any epidemic. So I had to stop. I had to stop. <laughs> but I do recommend you reading it. I think you would enjoy it. Pass. It's it's not it's not graphic. It's not nope. but like gross or anything. Pass. I'm just saying. It's it's a zombie thing. Mm, not the way you think it is. But okay. Nope. I know. Borg, White Walkers. That's about all I'll tolerate in this. That's all world. you can tolerate. <laughs> But Very well. so far, I'm I'm halfway through for first season of House of the Dragon, and uh, it's and I've only I only read Fire and Blood the one time, and the book is kind of based on mostly the second half of Fire and Blood, which covers mm-hmm. the Dance of the Dragons, which is what this show is about. Sure, the Targaryen Civil War. Mm-hmm. It, and to be honest with you, it's fascinating. I like it. Is it so far? Yeah. Well, uh, I heard what I, what I what what really got me hooked is that they had keep playing the same Game of Thrones theme song. Dun, dun. Well, they needed to save money somewhere. <laughs> yeah, with smart move though. <laughs> Phenomenal Twice. theme song. Everybody who loves the show loves that theme song. It's mm-hmm. iconic. You're right. They could toss money elsewhere. They didn't have to spend it on on an entirely new score. (laughs) So, oh, good. Well, let me. I look forward to your final report uh, upon completion of said season. So, have actually been 
been witness to a spoiler in that in that show. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but uh, it, I guess it's going to be pretty crazy. So you mean to wait till the end of the season? Yeah. Or a spoiler for season two? No, for the end of the season one. So. All right. Well, I'll finish it up. Well, let me know um, if you're blown away, because uh, apparently it's pretty wild. I, I, I have no context, so. Sure. <laughs> well, that which led me to believe, since you won't talk to me about wanting to talk about good and bad pilots in, in series finales. And, you know, um, Game of Thrones had a notoriously bad pilot that they didn't use that they were able to reshoot with a bunch of different actors, too, actually. Yes. And the first episode of Game of Thrones was quite good. And it ends... The pilot that I remember, yeah. And it ends with Jamie Lannister (laughs) being caught having sex with his sister, Cersei, at in an old abandoned tower in Winterfell, and Bran, who likes to climb, catches them, and, you know, Cersei's flipping out. Kid's stunned, doesn't know what to do, so Jamie just walks over and pushes him out the window. The things we do for love. Yeah. <laughs> the she, first well, episode keeps ends yelling, with... He saw us, first. he saw us, he saw us, he saw us, and, and he goes, I hear you. The things we do for love, and he pushes Bran out and we you know Bran lands on the camera essentially to to black out and you think right. oh my god he's dead like that's a pilot that's the they child ended the major character like, oh my god i mean you don't know he survives but they start out the series with making Bran the broken like <laughs> yeah and i remember Bran watching as a character that. got more and more annoying later it, he did. Part of that was just the way that he grew up, like if physically, and the other part was ugh, the bitterness that the the character would have and stuff that was trying to be expressed. The, none of that bitterness is actually ever good to to never fun to watch. Like well, was, in a character, in a main it, character, you could see it well, in a, like an ancillary character, and it accents the moment, but. Well, You'd think there'd be more bitterness, but after a while, it's just, you know, his personality kind of dies. It's kind of like when we were talking about the episode, Deep Space Nine episode, Life Support, where Boreal is losing yeah. his personality. Is a Jedi. His... I mean, most <laughs> Jedis had better personalities than that. Maybe the Chosen One didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I said most. Yoda most, had a great yeah. personality. Kenobi had a good personality. Mace Windu had a badass oh. motherfucker personality. No, he had no personality whatsoever. Don't do that. Not until the last movie. Yeah, not until last, but until then, like he was just like, uh. <laughs> yeah, he was. He was pretty. Say he, he was a little stiff. The Force. <laughs> yeah. like, None of that trademark uh, Sam Jackson charisma and the Phantom Menace. You see, you saw a little bit more in Attack of the Clones, and but you know he at least got to yell at a bad guy in this movie. Mm-hmm. Okay, so here's I've always a question. I've always said if you had put some of his best lines from other movies into into his Star Wars roles, it would have just made it so much better. Yeah, but that's too much. That's too meta, dude. That's too meta. <laughs> Although yeah, I mean, Star Wars doesn't. They literally do that, did. But... They literally did quote George. Quote George W. In um, uh, uh, the Revenge of the Sith. You're either with us or against us. Strategery. Well, they didn't say that. <laughs> that was Will Ferrell. <laughs> but yeah, so. And only a, only a, if you're not with me, you're my enemy. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. It's like, okay, we got you. We got that, you there was an absolute. <laughs> that was an absolute, all right, okay. <laughs> I mean, okay, so Game of Thrones, great. I remember when it first aired the very first day. I was at my in-laws. He had it on. Um, 
And that was back when that my child was an infant. No, my child was an infant. We see. It wasn't that uncomfortable to be to be honest with you. I, it's we're all adults, but yeah, I don't know. I'm not going to go into it. It's fine. <laughs> it's not weird. It wasn't that bad. Like other scenes in Game of Thrones, that first season would have been awful. So <laughs> there were some awful scenes throughout the series. Yes, but I will. I will say, great pilot. Pilot started yes, off very good. Awesome. Very good. How would you rate the 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 series finale? Not great. Not great. Why would you say not great? Well, and I'm not saying that Daenerys didn't exhibit signs of possible madness, you know, like steps towards that. But sure. the last two truncated seasons, it just felt half-assed. People were zipping all up rushed. and down the Seven Kingdoms. There was no journeys. Everybody was practically teleporting across the Seven Kingdoms. This is true. Uh, this is also true. You know, they didn't... En- entire plot threads were rushed. You had dumb things, like they built up the Golden Company, and then you get, like, no scenes with them. You know, uh, Tyrion seems less clever in in towards the end. I mean, if they had, instead of making like a seven and a six episode series, they had made 10 episodes each of the last two seri- seasons. I know they had already gone off the rails off of Martin's work <laughs> because he didn't fucking finish. But I think if you had had two full seasons, you could have shown a couple of extra things here and there. You would have, you know, Maybe they could have brightened up the, you know, the lighting they used for the Battle of Winterfell. Yeah. N- yeah, that and that that was definitely a stylistic bad move. We literally turned out all the lights in our house and turned the lighting up on the TV 100%, and it was still super dark. Yeah. And that 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 episode came out on a big weekend. Like, that was when Endgame came out. So the, the battle for the Starks was was a big thing that weekend. <laughs> they, they killed off a lot of characters in that episode too, which you would expect. But it was one battle and one episode. You'd kind of think the fight against the Night King might have taken well a couple. The 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 battle for Winterfell. I mean, it looked like the Dothraki were completely wiped out in two seconds, and yet yep. afterwards they weren't. But wiped out at all like <laughs> what happened to them <laughs> like, yeah <laughs> that was that i felt was a weird thing um and the on the march to to king's landing and everything so i would argue yes it was a very enticing pilot and the ending it did what it was supposed to do given the timing that they had but it wasn't great i mean the first five seasons were excellent season six was good <laughs> Season Seven. four, I got I started getting bored with it. Like season four, yeah. I started getting irritated with the, the gratuitous violence and what was it the the ba- the battle for Castle Black? Wasn't that season oh, four? Oh, that was a good one. I didn't I didn't find that enticing at all. I found that episode boring. I thought the battle for Castle Black was excellent. The whole episode was in there. There was no cuts to yeah, plot. Yeah, there was no cuts to other. Yeah, it was all dedicated to that. And I wasn't. Which, but but they cut to different parts of the cat of the fight. Sure. Which I. But, dude, I mean, it looked like the cover of a heavy metal album. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the Giants, and I, and I didn't create that thought. I got that off of honest trailers, but it went back through my mind, and I'm like, I had, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> you could pull a lot of things out of Game of Thrones that would look good on a on a Oh yeah. On a, on a heavy metal album. But yeah, yeah. I can see that. <laughs> I mean Was and they had of... some Go ahead. They had some really epic parts of that battle too, you know. John and Egret Egret dying in his arms and you know, you got the the Gran and like the the half dozen dudes who are trying to hold the gate against the giant to the end. And, you know, Sam getting off another great kill. 
Yeah. <laughs> was it season five where it ended with both the men of the North and the Black Watch teaming up against the White Walkers? And their entire army was thrashed as they're going out to sea. And then uh, uh, no, the Night it, King hard raises home. them. Yeah, Hard yeah, Home. Hard is that home season five or season six? That's season five. It didn't end them. I think season the end of season five was when they killed Jon Snow. It was. You're right. Because he and was then, bringing... He was bringing... That's right. He was bringing the refugees from, the, from the, the, the Northmen. Yeah. South of the Wall. Wild that's wings. what happened. Yeah. Wildlings. Thank you. He's a Northman, but they He's a Northman. You're right. You're right. We get that. Yeah. I I, I get it. Yeah. It's been a while. It's been five years. Yeah, I, I get you. I get you. It's... Um, oh. There was a lot of... I, clearly, there was some missed opportunities, but... The, the the series finale was kind of a letdown, right? You have the battle against Cersei in the second to last episode, and Daenerys mm-hmm. goes full batshit. Yeah, and it just and just there was no indication why she was supposed to do that. By the way, well, she just I didn't see any like triggers or you know no straw that broke the camel's back. She just got up and was like, "Yep." You know what? I'm just going to burn think, it all. I, well, Mesende's death or execution on the walls of King's Landing. I didn't, final know, I didn't find was, that to be a trigger. She 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 saw she did a lot of bad hold things. On, and hold on, and everything. hold on. Hold on. I'm, I'm giving you a list. There's that one. Mm-hmm. Probably, one probably the last person she trusted. She was already, you know, Tyrion... Release Jamie. They had um, Varys was trying to push Jon Snow as a replacement for her, and so there was there was all these triggers, you know, and and of course her loss of Jorah. Now the whole last half of season six sh- shows her losing everybody she trusted. Oh, and Jon Snow, by the way. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. She fell in love with him. She fell in love with him. He fell in love with with her. her. Well, he loved her too. And then they found, and he found out that she was his aunt. And that made things weird for him. Which back in the day. Less so for her because she's a Targaryen. Well, I was going to say, back in the day, probably wouldn't have been that weird. Uh, <laughs> well, let's not forget but the poor guy who literally just learned his entire life was a lie. Well, that is true. And I will say this there is no justice in Westeros. There is no good place to live in Westeros. There is no safe place to live in Westeros. Westeros sucks. That whole area, oh. that whole, the Westeros the whole- and. And the eastern, the eastern lands. Forget, it sucks to live every everywhere there. Everywhere. Whatever planet that is, it sucks. You're right. Maybe, maybe Spain, the place that's known as not Spain, <laughs> where Pedro Pascal was. So, Dorn? <laughs> yeah, Dorn. Maybe, but even then, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, uh, Martin's world was filled with everything. Horrible and yes. worse. But he knew how to write women as people. He knew how to do that. <laughs> they, he did have some very strong female characters. Yeah, like regular. I mean, they were women as people. Like they, they were, they were just, they were women, and they were, they were doing what they were supposed to. I mean, there's nothing remarkable in my mind about that. But for some reason, it's probably because it's not hard for me to write a woman as a person. Um. <laughs> because I view women as people. I don't know. But for some reason, it was a big thing back in like 2014, 2015. Like, what's the secret to George R. R. Martin writing strong women? And his answer, because they're people. Like, <laughs> I write them as people. So. Yep. All right. I think we beat this one dead. Um,. I want to move on to one. Star Trek Voyager. Mm. 
Mm. What do you think of their pilot episode? Pilot was was good. I disagree. I found it boring. And I found it especially boring. And I did a rewatch of this show recently, of this episode. I found it especially boring when they beamed on to the, the, the beacon. And, the caretakers array? Yeah, the caretakers array. And they were in some farmhouse land. And I'm like, ah, jeez. There's nothing mysterious about this. We Budget. all know this is a holodeck, guys. And like, what, what you know... And obviously, these are all aliens. These are not real people. Why? This isn't a mystery, guys. Like, you're being, you know, and, and the Starfleet officers obviously weren't being fooled, but that just made it a dumb fool's errand as a plot device anyway. Because it didn't last that. I mean, it lasted, it was a good 20 minutes of them being there out of two hours. I remember watching that in, in January 3rd, 1995, going, ah. Oh, what what is this like? Oh, well, remember I said it was good. I didn't say it was great. Yeah, I I would argue that Voyager's series premiere was mediocre at best. Mediocre. Well, that was what you think. Mm-hmm. You know, I thought it was I thought it was good. It left me curious for more, interested for more. I mean, it was left open-ended enough, but I also felt like with the way the Kazon were portrayed on, on they, the Ocampo homeworld, they didn't look like a spacefaring civilization. And yet yeah. suddenly we were presented with this massive ship that's like three times bigger than a Galaxy-class ship that isn't as fast like <laughs> that they have at the end. Like, that, that's weird. I'm just uh, saying th that was one of the reasons why the Kazon never took off. They were never like properly introduced. I get it. They were supposed to be an, an analog to LA street gangs, but LA street gangs Please, don't they have were just, like, they were just bargain basement Klingons. <laughs> they were, <laughs> but the, you know, even the Klingons didn't have ships that big and Klingons are a very well organized warrior society. The Negvar. That that ship was that the ship. You remember this? You remember the name of the Kazon ship? No, the Negvar oh, is the name the, of the, the huge Klingon the capital, ship. The capital ship, yeah. That uh, the flagship. Yeah, the flagship. Yeah, it dwarfed every other fleet ship in the Klingon fleet. It did, which was the same ship that we saw in uh, All Good Things. Yeah, they just tweaked it a little. <laughs> so. I like that they made a whole new model for all good things and they just like reused it. I mean, it was great. It was a good idea, but I mean, they made a whole new model for that one episode, which was pretty cool. I think they were doing an, a future investment kind of thing. You know, it was a future investment because that was supposed to be whatever it was, 25 years after the end of next gen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but a ship that size hadn't been built yet. And then the Klingons, Use the original, and then that became, instead of that being just a one-off or like a handful, then apparently it becomes the standard ship, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But It uh, wasn't until what... Deep Space Nine more than one attack cruiser at any given time. This is true. <clears throat> this is true. Um, what did you think of the... Okay, so I found the, the the opening for Voyager a little boring. There are some good parts to it. I liked the idea of having it seeing the penal colony. I liked the idea of being able to, you know, be introduced to new characters such as the Doctor and the First Officer, who were both wholly unlikable characters, and then later just killed off, like, real quick. <laughs> they made it so it wasn't morally ambiguous to not want to care about them. They made clear about that. That was a writing construct. Um, yeah. So, and I, I like I like how we're dealing with Harry Kim, a, a, a green, what do you call him? Green Gill? What green around the ears? He was just green. Yeah, a green, green. ensign. A green ensign, just, you know, 
trying to find a friend in someone who's a you know a fallen fallen standard. Well, mostly it's because Paris helped him not get swindled by Quark. That too. He did have a. He did have a. <laughs> and Quark. So, Quark came off as pretty nefarious too. By the way. Uh, <laughs> Don't, don't tell Slanders me. Slanders against my people at Starfleet Academy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how would you have reacted? Because when I was watching that as, yeah, a 14, no, almost 14 year old, I found that to be very entrapping. And I, I felt Harry Kim's uncom- discomfort. Like, d- d- what would you, what would you have done in his, his shoes? Uh, maybe stepped in it just like he did. Everybody's green. I know, right? Um, but I also could find myself being a real smart ass like Tom Paris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you could be a smart ass, but you wouldn't be able to use the knowledge that Tom Paris had. You would have been, you would have found a different way out of it. N- no, if I was an older guy like Paris. Oh, true. Yes, More I, I world, would grant that. Know. Yeah, worldly, yes. Which is what Tom I, Paris I would was. have enjoyed going on and, and tweaking somebody's nose. I still do. <laughs> uh, but it was all right. I like the fact that they start at Deep Space Nine, that they go into the Badlands. They had a frequent-ish recurring Cardassian, Golovec, who actually appeared in Voyager, Deep Space Nine, and The Next Generation. Yeah. You know, he he only had like probably a half a dozen appearances, but he did it on three shows. That's yes. pretty actually that's it's pretty impressive. Yes. And at times he was a little more nefarious than others. He had um he was pretty good in Journey's End. That's how Picard got him to to agree to the transfer of the, the Native American planet to the Cardassians. Mm-hmm. So uh, it was helpful. They had people from pre-existing shows there to send them off. Yeah, no, and I mean that's also a, a Star Trek <laughs> tradition. But yeah, I I, I, I agree. I agree. Um, a, a tradition that was destroyed come uh, <clears throat> discovery. Anyway, <laughs> so. That boated well right. for them, didn't Why don't it? You go to the uh, series finale then. I felt that overall the series finale was actually pretty good. I felt that they dealt with the Borg properly. I felt that it was a good idea to jump to the future. I felt it a little weird that we didn't get to see Voyager and the characters like reunite with their family in yeah, real time that that's the that was a missed opportunity they give you the sailing into the sunset yeah you know, flanked by the federation fleet with earth in the background that is there's some symbolism there but i do think you're right i think it would have been good to see them welcomed home right and we saw that we saw we, you know with their they kind of did a back door of that by being in the future having the reunion parties and everything on the anniversary of when they got there what was it the 10 year anniversary that they got back and it was like what 35 years in the future or something something like that yeah or actually right around mm, 2400 like it was right around there um so uh, I, you know, it's fine. I do find it interesting that Janeway felt the only way to fix things that went wrong was to go back in time. I kind of don't understand that. Quantum Leap. She was watching episodes of Quantum Leap. Mm, was she, though? <laughs> With Captain Archer? <laughs> yeah. She read some of Archer's logs. Yeah. Realized... Oh, boy. <laughs> To, so, to I did find it, it to weird. fix what one what was it to help fix what once went to, wrong to make right what once went wrong make right what once went wrong see but here's the thing how many crew members of Voyager were lost and she only was motivated by the loss of Seven and Chakotay like that felt a little weird 
I felt that the the whole idea of bringing Voyager home earlier, okay, fine. I felt the motivation to bring them home earlier was a little weird. It would have been something if they brought something home to Earth that was deadly to Earth. And the, and Janeway is like, oh my gosh, I need to go back in time and fix it so that we don't bring whatever that was from the Delta Quadrant to Earth. And we need to warn the Alpha Quadrant about this issue. I think that that would have been a better motivator. But just her, you know, missing her first officer in Seven, whom she never really had much of a bond with. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I would if I had seen much of the last season uh, any time recently. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't either. I need to. I, the, the Voyager is the only show that I haven't bought at all. I, I need to. Well, I need to buy I, it. I I do believe that many people think that the Chakotay thing was rushed at the end. A lot seven. of people feel that way. And. Uh, I mean, there were some people who thought that Deanna's supposed death in the future of all good things seemed a little meh, especially because she's underutilized a lot of times. <laughs> True. Not, 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 not arguing against that. But, but it's, they also it's didn't fit use... inside the canon of Inzati. Right, but they also <laughs> didn't use all the actors... Like Gates McFadden, Jonathan Frakes, and LeVar Burton, and Will Wheaton weren't on the bridge of the Enterprise to the start of the Farpoint mission. You got Denise Crosby and Colm Meany back. Right. So. Well, and this is probably going to bring us into the next generation, which is fine. It'll be a nice dovetail. But I Endgame, will argue. Endgame, good. Endgame. Not as good as Avengers Endgame. Got it. Endgame in the good column. Yeah, definitely. And that that titles that title inspired Kevin Feige to name Avengers Endgame Endgame. Which was also using the going back in time to to fix Star Trek Six went went wrong. (laughs) Oh yeah, you're right. You're totally right. Yeah. (laughs) The time heist. Yeah. (laughs) Huh. Done better. Yeah, it was done better. Literally, because there was a huge affliction. 50% of all life on Earth was destroyed. And in Endgame, Avengers Endgame. Oh, and yeah. so there was a motivation to make right what once went wrong. Whereas Janeway is like, I'm going to change this whole timeline that we've been established in for mm, several decades now. Just because I want Chicote and Seven back. Well, I'm sure she probably would have saved the lives of several other crewmen who died in the interim. True, perhaps. But still, is that really a temporal responsibility that that she wants to undertake? She obviously did. But was that response? She's a Starfleet captain. It's exactly what they do. (laughs) It's a prerogative. It's in in their unwritten (laughs) guidebook. I will say I enjoyed Endgame. I thought it did well. It did justice to the Borg. It was a great way to end the Borg as we know it, and as we further saw in Picard. Yep, and as we saw further in Picard, how that played out, fine. But the premise for Endgame was rather weak. The the execution, good. Premise, weak. But overall, more on the good side. Since we've flexed our guns to the TNG, TNG, encounter at Farpoint. I'll 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 err on the side of good, even though it wasn't great. Okay. I think it, uh, the, the whole you. the whole point of far encounter far point, it was literally two different episodes, and but 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 not the Q you know, stuff was put in late in the process too. From what you I, are correct, I that's, that's what I was pointing out. But yes. really, all, all this all it really served to do was was be a platform for the most important, arguably the most important person in Star Trek history. Guest character? Or Picard. Yeah, call Meany. <laughs> as Miles O'Brien. The most important man in Starfleet history. <laughs> he didn't even have a name in that episode, did he? He was like Chief, no. wasn't he? 
They called him Khan because he they was Khan. a Khan officer. <laughs> yeah. He took over at uh, he took over on the battle bridge. I remember seeing that for the first time in the early nineties, going, "Oh, he's even in the very first episode. This is great." Which is which good is great. why they brought him back in, in all good things. Yeah, it was perfect, kismet. But yeah, it was good. They had some the the. Actually, and while Four Point Station, you can argue, was kind of wonky, the idea of, you know, this so-called advanced technology that this one station had turned out that they were enslaving these, you know, uh, special life forms. Yeah, the, the very was jelly, the space plot. jellyfish. The space jellies, yeah. Which very we much, also uh, saw in Picard, by the way. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I always thought that that was like, did, was this where they were born? And they didn't really let on to that. You figure Beverly, Will, and, and Picard would be like, you know, this kind of reminds me of Farpoint. I don't, I, I don't think Beverly, Paramount. Are, are these the same creatures that we encountered 30 <laughs> years ago? With our encounter at Farpoint, and he would have even said the title. And yes, he would. <laughs> um, I don't think Paramount wanted them to do that far, because it would have been that too esoteric for, for for Paramount's taste. It would have been right for the fans. It would have been right, and it was. Those were the space jellies, by the way. Those were them. Those were the jellies that gave them awe and hope. Like at the end of Encounter at Farpoint, by the way, showing true love. And the beauty of of dedication and, and commitment, and we're the seeing beauty the beauty of the of galaxy. Life. Yeah, and we're seeing the birth of new life and new hope, and and Riker well, realizing you can't use this. the term new hope in Star Trek. No, you can't. But I'm just using that as descriptive. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it, I mean, they were used for both both the same purposes in Picard hey, and. You know, did, do you know what the uh, alternate name is for uh, uh, Way of the Warrior? Uh oh. The Empire no. Strikes Back. Mm. <laughs> that hurt. That hurt. <laughs> it was good, but it hurt. <laughs> You're pretty satisfied. <laughs> it's not yours. Because I know it's not. <laughs> no, it's mine. Is it, it just yours? hit me. You son of a it bitch. Just hit me. <laughs> so. Oh. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Um, I would argue that there was some good sci-fi elements with humanity being on trial for its sins and everything with Q. And you introduce Q, who, you know, I mean, the writers had no idea what to use Q with uh, for at this point, other than a judge in the first season. Um, they, they later but, learned how to use him as like some puck kind of character. Well, all they needed to do was just kind of let John Delancey do his shtick. Sure. And he just he just sunk his teeth so deeply into that role from the get go. <laughs> that it really, it, it's worth it. Yes. Absolutely. It's kind of like having, Ro it was kind of not quite to the level, but it's like the Star Trek version of having Robin Williams, uh, you know, running loose. Sure. Just causing a delicious chaos wherever he goes. He was the only good part of season two, by the way. So <laughs> it was nice to see him in season two of Picard. Oh, I thought we were saying John season two of the next generation. I oh, was no, like, no, no, no. Measure of a no. Man is season two. You're right. I didn't specify. Uh, he was. It, it was nice to see him in season two of Picard. Picard was shit, let's be honest. But season two was awful. It was terrible. But season Delancey three was is like, what you have to hold on to. That's the only thing I can hold on to, man. <laughs> that's the only season I bought. I bought that digitally when, as soon as it was available. I so, probably should too, but then again, I have Paramount Plus, so. Mm, Paramount Plus isn't going to be around for much longer. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. You say that, I'll wait till I see what happens. Uh, I can guarantee that. Anyway. Um, but Did it hurt hitting that pitch? A little bit. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know. All right. So we dealt with Encounter at Farpoint. What was nice about Encarno at Farpoint was it dovetailed very nicely into the end of TNG with All Good Things, mm-hmm. where the trial never ended. It was alluded to with the Vosh episode, was it? When Gosh. when Q when Q uh, meets Vosh and and he and, and Picard mentions you put us you put you put humanity on trial, and and Q even jokes ah. Trial hasn't ended. It's just on hiatus. So, Mon Capitan. So, <laughs> it was a little tease, which I thought was interesting. Don't think so linear. The yeah. Trial don't... never. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that what he said? Or was Something that in all like good that. things? No, he did say the trial never ends, but he said that yeah. to, said something like that to Jack Crusher. Oh, yeah. The, no, yes, that's right. In Picard season three. But when he met Vaj, like there was that illusion like, oh, the trial's not over. Interesting. And then we see them going back to this trial. And by the way, I got to say the technology of the filmography. And the costumes from 1994, very different from 1987. Can we talk about that? <laughs> they were two different shows, two very different styles. Well, the, it was I weird seeing just John better, Delaney better, that way. better cinematography. I mean, clearly better recording equipment. The sound was better. Yes. I mean, everything was better because it was an extremely successful show on season seven. The technology but of the time also improved. I'm sure the trial scene was a little campy in the first in the in the pilot. Yes, and it was, but they had uh, to tran- they had to transition those over. To 1994. Let's also remember, though, (laughs) we're only about like 40 years, 50 years from what they're talking about. They were almost 100 years out (laughs) when that thing came on. They were like, oh, this this looks shitty in the future. And now we're like, oh, golly, that's a lot closer than objects in the rearview mirror may be closer than they appear. Well, I, I hold hope that World War Three will only remain in the Asian region, as, as Star Trek legacy scribes have said, but whatever. <laughs> so, that being said. Never get involved in a land war in Asia. You've heard No, this never, never. And never match wits with a Sicilian when death is on the line. Exactly. So say a grand niggas sec. Inconceivable. <laughs> So, but I loved all good things. I love, I love a good wrap up. I love, you know, what I love about a show when it starts, it starts something. Oh, here, no, actually, here's a good analogy. Shh, Tuck. Shh. Sorry, my dog's barking. Um, I love a good joke that's a big setup at the beginning of a comedic set. And then they, they like the repetitive, re- do a repetitive thing. Like, so what room are you staying in? And then he meets meets another person. Oh, so what room are you staying in? And then he's over in Alaska, and he's over like shooting, you know, pictures of bears and things like that. And some random person goes, "So what room are you staying in?" Like it's a comedic thing to tie it all back into the first opening joke. I like that. I like that means that the overall show was wrapped up in a nice little bow. It had its beginning, middle, and end, and it arcs back to the beginning. Done. Perfect. And that's exactly what all good things did. They they it's literally like, went back to the beginning. They were in the like middle. Poetry. And they it went lies. to the end. Stop it. Stop it. That's not what that was. I knew you were trying to you were you had that in your head for the last two minutes. I get it. So that's not what that was. But it it, it does have a certain symmetry to it, right? In, in that, you know, it we begin. We end where we begin, which is a new beginning. The The trial for humanity. So say we all. Ends. I know. And we're going to talk about that one, too, in a minute. But uh, I this I, this is a very good example of. A callback starting off, I think, on the uh, on the right foot. 
Yep. While still the execution, you know, needed some work a little, but it paid off in a big way. Uh, clearly, All Good Things is is one of the best series finales of all time. One of the best, the, clearly one of the best Star Trek series finales. You paid off so much. You brought, you managed to get Denise Crosby back to play Natasha Yar. Not just a blink and you'll miss a cameo, but no, she played. Like, she's she, pretty prominent. She played the, yeah. She has a couple of scenes. You know, she's kind of, in some ways, a, you know, a de facto. At times, I think she's more second in command on that enterprise than, than Data technically was. Well, she was, honestly. I mean, it, it seemed like it. Even, you even have, in the seventh season, yeah. You have Kyle Meany as Miles O'Brien, who by that time is a very clearly defined character. Yep. With not only six plus seasons of TNG under his belt, but two <laughs> seasons of Deep Space Nine by this point. Right, and they mentioned the ship in the bottle from Ship in the Bottle. Uh, no, from Ship in a Bottle was the one with... Was Ancient message Valerians? In a oh no! Oh oh oh! Booby, was, trap. Uh, booby, trap. booby trap! Booby trap! Booby trap! Booby trap! Yeah, they mentioned ship in the bottle from booby trap, and Which was a and, nice callback. Yep, that was good. And Picard has this like big smirk, like oh, I'm bonding with him, and then then <laughs> O'Brien's like, "I'm sorry, sir. How did you know?" Like, uh, uh, uh your personnel it's report. In your personnel file. <laughs> like, wow, that's deep. I didn't know they went that deep in my file. Yeah, you know? I, I th- that that is something that gets on my that that drives me a little nuts sometimes. <laughs> People are like, oh, I read in your personnel file that you liked cream cheese on your sandwich. Who the yeah. fuck puts that in their personnel file? In the military, I'm sure you've a few personnel files. You've contributed to a few. You know what the army does? What's that? You know, like when you're when you're new to a unit, they'll ask you, oh, hey. Here's a sheet of like five things about you. So when you, because we have these things called hail and farewell, a unit will hail you, welcome you, you know, be like a big unit function and you'll be, leaders will be hailed, welcome aboard, you know, introduce leaders, their spouse, that sort of thing. And then it's also a farewell when they'll say goodbye to people. And that's where people will get their, you know, farewell gifts from their unit and stuff like that. But usually when you're being hailed, somebody, you like give the colonel like a index card with some shit about you and your family. Well, let's see, it says here that George likes long walks on the beach with his wife, hockey, and uh, what's this? Oh, um, ice fishing with dynamite. <laughs> hey, that's great. <laughs> and you have three daughters, Larry, Mo, and Curly. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. They will do stuff like that where you'll give like legit stuff and then somebody will make up things just to kind of kind of, you know, get you. I I got the long walks on the beach and put that on there. And he enjoys long walks on the beach. You know, they'll throw these things, try to, you know, break the ice a little. Um, yeah. But, you know, that's like something like they're like, here, quick slapdash. Give them this to us before you, the boss goes in tomorrow night to talk about you. <laughs> Oh, okay, great. It's not in my personnel file. He doesn't like hmm, yeah. this index card where he says he swam collegiately. He needs to go in his file here next to copies of his Bronze Star and his, you know, overseas deployments that I can have pulled off of my online. All that stuff is on my was on my online uh, record that our personnel people would pull down. Maybe uh, it does. Maybe it does need to be put in there. You don't know. <laughs> You don't know. No. <laughs> In, invented a game called Cucumber Ball. Not as nope. popular as Pickleball. No. Nope. <laughs> not not going not gonna to play Cucumber Ball, sir. Not going to do it. <laughs> not going to do that. <laughs> really? You playing can't order me. Sounds any better. Nope. <laughs> I'm just saying, Cucumber sounds painful. <laughs> so did Cornhole the first time I heard it. Yeah. <laughs> Why is it called cornhole? I, uh, what, what was it called? Oh, I remember it was beanbag toss. That's what it was called. Like, well, I think the original beanbags were filled with dried corn or something like I that. I know. I know. But, you throw them in the hole. 
We got gotcha. you. Yeah. Midwest representing with on the nose references. Gotcha. So <laughs> don't you know? But anyway, <laughs> that's upper Midwest. True. And they did that. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> definitely think um, all good things was a great way to end next generation. So, I love, I loved all so good far things. of, of the three shows we've done said, Definitely has the best series finale of the three. Okay. Yeah. Game of Thrones, I think, had the best start to finish pilot of the three so far that we've talked about. Yep. And Voyager's just kind of middling across the board because Game of Thrones clearly had the worst finale. <laughs> this is true. Look at and you. Next gen. Score. Next gen and, and Voyager. I think Voyager might have had a slightly better. Um, what pilot because it was more better. polished. Yeah. But, and, and it was, it's, it's, it was a victim of star Trek familiarity at that point, because again, we're like, Oh, this is a holodeck guys. What are you like? Like, you know, they literally is standing there with the tricorders scanning the woman with the corn corn. Like, well, she's not red. She's registering as a pile of uh, proton masses and whatnot. I'm like, Oh, the well, holodeck. It's a holodeck. It's a hol- I could have told you it was a holodeck, Tuvok. So, <laughs> like, yeah, of course. So it was a pr- it was a product it was a product of uninspired storytelling and familiarity with story tropes that the writers used. Mm. Well, I mean, all good things, you know, is it's really hard to beat. A lot of TV shows are are held up to that level. I mean. Kevin Feige even basically said that he was trying to make Endgame like his all good things. Yeah, that is true. Which, by the way, hats off Kevin for even he making that. He did a very good attempt. job. It was very well done. I thought Endgame. I don't know. I'm I'm hearing a lot of s talk about Endgame versus Infinity War. I felt both movies were on par with each other. Do you feel differently? Well, I'll say this. I didn't walk out of Endgame feeling like I, my heart was bleeding. <laughs> well, that means it was an effective there, storytelling. There, there was sadness because yeah. you know Stark dying, Natasha dying, and Steve kind of going going off. off. But, yeah, but it was. I mean, with the exception maybe of Natasha dying, that's the one that I think. I mean. Tony, that in the moment it hurts you, but Natasha basically sacrificing herself and then in many ways being not forgotten, but being overshadowed. Yeah. You know, there was it's a little bit less fulfilled by that one. Even though in some ways it was supposed to push Barton forward, which is kind of one of the things that drove his own TV series. Sure. Um, but you know, overall, uh, for, we could almost talk about pilot and series finale for the MCU. Well, I mean, literally that 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 is kind of what it is. But you know, I mean, we'll just go a little into it. I mean, because the fact that Endgame was so well patterned off of star trek and and all good things and because they visited favorite eras by the way you know actually not so favorite eras they actually redeemed thor the dark world (laughs) you know and um you know seeing another angle of thor the dark world was neat and seeing an angle of of them making fun of peter quill calling him an idiot when we thought he was the greatest thing ever in Guardians of the Galaxy. I, I'm just going to say that's still one of my favorite movie intros of all time. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's just, it's just so damn fun. It's great. It's fantastic. And, so he's an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> but you hear it without the music. You, you hear like, it without the music, and he's just singing like, who oh, will get you in love? <laughs> like, um, I don't even think he's singing. It's, he's like, he's he listening singing. to. No, he's singing. Oh, is he? Oh. Yeah, he is singing in Endgame. In Endgame, he is. Um, but 
yeah, and then they do the the, the final signatures. The, the the you know the in the title sequence at the end. That was Star Trek. That was Star Trek Six. I mean, and and he he loved that, and he definitely he he admits he took it from Star Trek Six. So all of this stuff, he Endgame was directly inspired by Star Trek end tropes. Start not end tropes, tropes. Star Trek tropes. St- stuff that was done by Star Trek already. Agreed. So, um, and it was done well. Star Trek VI, the end of the movie series, was done very well. All good things. Very well done. Nice right off into the sunset, by the way. And by the way, Picard entering the the poker game. Unexpected. Liked that. But, but very nice. It was and very nice. Hopeful. Well, he sits there and he stops. And he goes... I should have done this sooner. And and Troy goes, you are always welcome. Uh, that that was a nice little touch. That's a nice little thing. Like that, you know, you, you, you hear that and you're like, you know, what? I probably need to call this person or call this other person. I, I need to. It's a moment where it makes you recollect on your life like, oh. Gotcha. That's a check on me. Gotcha. <laughs> like. You know, and it's funny that three other main characters did, or two other main characters and one recurring character got to play in the poker games before <laughs> Picard did. Wesley, Pulaski, and O'Brien all ended up in the poker games before Picard did. Didn't Roe? I don't think so. What about Guinan? No. Shelby did. Shelby. Okay, yeah, Shelby. And yeah. Um, Guinan's understudy, Ben, in Lower Decks, wanted to go and end up, after he cleaned out the Lower Deckers, he's like, Oh, that's right, well, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not in uniform. I can go in and harass. I can jump, try to jump into the bigger game. Ben! Like, come on in. Ben, come on in. What we can do for you? <laughs> I just totally cleaned welcome. out a bunch of junior officers. Figured I'd do the same with you. <laughs> The poker yeah. games were good. It, it was, it, it it kind of showed to be a little less stuffy than some of the other recreation forms that you would see on the Enterprise D. Let's go sure. do classical music concerts. Right. Let's do Shakespeare in the holodeck. Right. You know? Recreate the uh, um, a Christmas Carol. Data, I need you to to to, you know, really figure out what Ebenezer Scrooge is feeling here. <laughs> Which is one of the few Christmas references in all of Star Trek. Mm-hmm. There were two. There were only two. <laughs> Subject to, uh, please see these in previous episodes of those sci-fi guys. Right. Plug, plug. <laughs> this is anyway. True. But you, you, things, what though. you did get with all good things was you got a lot of loose ends tying up. You know, you had a wonderful salute to both. I wouldn't uh, say loose some... ends. It was just a great salute to plot the show. Threads. Wouldn't even say plot threads. It was just a great salute to the series. Because yeah, there were no this... there weren't really outstanding plot threads except for Deanna and Worf. And that disappeared. Yeah, and that disappeared. Like, you know, I mean that was the only outstanding plot thread. But it was a salute to the series and all it accomplished and, and everything. Well, the plot thread of the the humanity's trial. It didn't yeah, and close that it wrapped out, up. But it and that wrapped up. No, the trial well. never ends. I know, but that it was but that's a good wrap up, right? Because life doesn't end. Life always continues. And and there is no end. Which is encouraging. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was it was a really good finale. Yeah. So, so since we've talked about some of the others, let's go ahead and talk Deep Space Nine. Best pilot of all Star Trek. Emissary. The best one. Starts off with the Battle of Wolf 359. Awesome. Great job. Great battle sequence. Like just it fantastic. Was. 
It was a like, it was a very good battle sequence. 1993, by the way, like 1992 technology uh, aired. Yep. Early January '93, but so I mean there was but that was probably the biggest battle we had ever seen in Star Trek, uh, up to that point. Yes. It was well done. Uh, we we got to see the board just also, destroy yes. the seventh fleet or whatever fleet it was. I think it was the seventh. There was no. They, it they was never mentioned a, it. I'm, I'm going off of the fan film. <laughs> no, not. It was a. It I was know. a ragtag collection of ships they could throw together to stop it. Right. Yeah. Should have been. Best a, you can call it Admiral Hanson's fleet. Admiral Ham. Admiral Hanson's fleet. Yes, of course. And so. they got umbopped across the. Across the <laughs> um. But take a look at if anyone's caring. There's a great fan film on YouTube to watch about the the Wolf the Battle of Wolf three five nine. A lot of stuff brought in from Picard, from Deep Space Nine, from TNG. Like they mesh it all together. Like you see, you see Liam Shaw as lieutenant uh, right, during the evacuation. A, uh, scene. You, you do it's see something. Still-ish. Yeah. yeah, it's a still ish of him. But really well done. Fully recommend it. I think it's Jax, J-A-X. And just do Jax, J- T-N-G, Wolf 359. It, it, you won't be disappointed. It was an inside job, according to that crazy conspiracy guy on Lower Decks. <laughs> Twas. Twas. So. But a greatest opening battle, opening sequence ever. Fantastic battle sequence. We got to see... Uh, we got introduced to Cisco in his worst moment in his entire life where he loses his wife, who's already dead, by the way. I, when I first saw it, I thought she was still alive when he abandoned her, which was would have been awful, which, you know, I felt that pain. But if you read the 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 novel, the beam he's trying to lift off of her is also like scorching hot and he like burns his, and cuts his hands trying to get to her. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's uh, yeah, I can see that. And he can only save Jake, and and I mean, just fantastic. That sets up the, the you know, the commander for Deep Space Nine right there. And he's and he's then, in an escape pod, and he sees his ship with his wife on it explode, mm-hmm. and boom, you know, that's the end of the opening sequence. Holy crap! Opens up three years later. They're fishing. He and Jake are fishing. Well, Jake's fishing. And then they talk about the new assignment and then they walk off the dock onto the ship from the holodeck, which was also a really good transition, by the way. Yeah. Plus, very well it done. Also can, it also showed one of the key cornerstones of the series. Ben and Jake's relationship. Yeah, exactly. Very well established from early There's on. a little Andy Griffithy too. Well, you know, I, the, the I intro think that to was Andy Griffiths was. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think it was a bit of a nod there, you know, the father, son, yeah. the single father, the kid at the fishing hole with the fishing pole. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I completely agree. And that and there's nothing bad with that. So uh, it was, you know, a new transition to the 90s, you know, father son relationship in the 90s, which we don't see even that relationship anymore now, which I find disappointing. You don't find what I... fathers very often. What I liked about it, yes, that is definitely true. And the the father son relationship was a wonderful part of the show, and one I one of the things I did like. But another thing I liked was just how shitty Deep Space Nine looked when they showed up. It really did Basically, look awful. It, it kind of looked <laughs> like they showed up in something out of a Star Wars movie. It really was. I mean, Chief and O'Brien the, was, had his, sho- his sleeves rolled up. Everyone was sooty and sweaty and gross. And half the systems weren't working. Yeah, <laughs> Kira's yelling at people. There's a there's fights on the promenade. Mm-hmm. Thievery. By the way, Quark's makeup was not great. I'd have to double check that. I, I that, was, that didn't catch me, but it, you're probably right. The nose was kind of. <laughs> too large and it seemed i think it if it interfered with his ability to talk so I, th- I think they adjusted the prosthetics um it's just it i mean it looks like quark only it looks like quark who then later had a uh <laughs> rhinoplasty right <laughs> 
Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, no. And, uh, and not to mention, Odo's makeup far flatter or far, far less, I guess I should yeah. say. Yeah, it, it flattened his face a little bit, but it was it didn't make him look as plastic as he later well, appeared. It, it, it actually made him look a little more humanish. It, yeah. it almost would be better if that was the look he achieved by the end of the series as he got better at making a more right. humanoid face. <laughs> you know what this I mean? True. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That would have been a pretty cool career, you know, progression there, but you know. <laughs> just listen, you can't think of everything. You can't think of everything. <laughs> you can't think of everything. <laughs> so but uh and then the battle with the Cardassians coming back, noting that there is a, a wormhole nearby. Uh, they were actually looking for Gul Dukat, who disappeared into the wormhole. That's right. Following Cisco. Thank you. They're like, Thank where's Gul Dukat? Then, right. And let's not forget the fact that O'Brien, with this piece of shit that was falling apart, managed to figure out a way to move the station, which was originally in the orbit of Bajor, right. to the mouth of the wormhole. Do you know how much power that takes? To, to yeah, move something it was, that big with thrusters. They, 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 talk, <laughs> they took they a little bit of artistic license. <laughs> yeah, they talked about, oh, if we do this, it like changes the inertial dampening of whatever. They re- makes it they, seem yeah, like they it's made lighter. It, they made space a little lighter in front. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's space. I, I guess if you have even a halfway decent engine, it'll move something. It's kind of, it's kind of. Well, they, that was kind of a mini warp engine that they did without going faster than light. That, that's literally how warp works. Like, you know, you, you move the space in front of you. Yeah, they created some sort of subspace bubble around it or something. Yeah, well, a gravitational was, it, bubble or something with the yeah, inertial it was, dampeners. It was all so. O'Brien wizardry. Yeah, and he could do they everything. Had, <laughs> they did have some, some very good scenes, and you could tell right off the bat from that show that they weren't going to be as tied to Gene Roddenberry's um, vision as closely as TNG. I mean, for starters, you see the main character's wife die. You see the worst moment in Federation history in like 200 years. Yeah. You, You see the commanding officer pop off to a superior officer. Yeah. Your new lead taking pot shots at... Your favorite captain, the fan, the, the fan captain, favorite, the fan favorite yeah. captain, the, the well-established captain, like, <laughs> like, yeah, that was a shocking moment. By the way, I don't, I, I can't remember how many times. <clears throat> Sorry, we've talked about that scene. We've talked about it enough. We're not going to go into it, but that was a shocking moment in Star Trek lore. I, I, I subscribe to a lot of Facebook pages for like Trek memes and news. And there, somebody put up some promotional footage, uh, some promotional pictures from an em- em- emissary where there's it's Avery Brooks and, and Patrick Stewart, like, you know, arms around each other, big smiles. Oh, yeah, that was a TV like, guide. Yeah, it, it, it's a pretty good picture. It's, it's hard to argue with that. I mean, you're talking about two powerhouse actors. Yeah. <laughs> and like I said, the only way that they could have pulled it off without denigrating any other characters was just having the two of them alone in a scene. That's it. And that's the only way it worked out. <laughs> you never you never saw them together again. Yes, you did. But, well, yeah, At the but end, by themselves. When the Enterprise comes back. But by themselves. Yeah, in the, in the at the end of the episode. I know. You saw them again together, but they were again alone together. Oh, yeah. There was no one else with them because it would have been pointless to have any other characters in that room with all that raw acting power. When when I was younger, I did not enjoy the Prophet storylines as much. Particularly, but how Cisco basically has to come to grips with his grief when he finally meets the Prophet. It's like, well, will you live in this time? He's like, he's like, you live here. He's like, well, yeah, part part of me does, I guess. And it kind of forces him to realize he's been living in the path and being, you know, pigeonholed by his wife's death. And, you know, at this point, he's considering 
resigning from Starfleet and you know even though he when he gets after he yells at Picard and he goes on goes on to Deep Space Nine and does try to make friends. But you know, it, it's it's hard to argue with you know the the growth you see in Cisco even by the end of that episode. And he found that growth through a religious parable. The prophets. Yeah. yeah. A religion. Interesting. <laughs> right. But it could also be it could also <laughs> be psychology too, though. True. He and was they kind did, of they forced to re-examine very, his life. Yeah, they padded it in a very pro psychological way. But let's also remember that a lot of clear, uh, clear, uh, clergy are psychologically trained. Well, yeah, and many. That's why we. That's one of the reasons we have chaplains assigned to every unit. It's not just uh, <laughs> you go talk to the chaplain, not just to find out what you know when the next service is. It's some, sometimes you need someone to talk to, and somebody who can't be compelled to talk. <laughs> At least if you got a Catholic priest who can't be compelled to spill your secrets. But uh, right. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is is that Cisco kind of comes back a changed person. Yes. Energized. He decides he wants to say he, he wants purpose. to help. He, he is energized. But you also get to see at times that Cisco charm and that Cisco mischief. Uh-huh. Like when he basically yeah. blackmails Quark into staying. Yeah. He knows <laughs> like it'd be like if, you know, if whatever Sears pulled out of a mall. Yeah. Back in the heydays of malls, people were like, oh, my God, Sears is leaving. What, what's that mean for the mall? Be like the mall owner going ahead and blackmailing the manager of the Sears to stay. Yeah. <laughs> to keep all the other stores in line. That's true. You're not wrong. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. that's exactly it. And that, you know, and we never saw We never saw. We didn't really see a Starfleet officer do that at that point. Not not to that level. And that was cool. And that was neat. And, and overall, I mean, here's the other part. Watching watching that episode contemporaneously when I was 12, it was a little heady. It was a little too heady for me. So I, at the time, I oh. thought it was good. I thought it was okay. But I didn't appreciate it for what it is. Now, looking back on it, as an adult and any adult at the time who was a fan of Star Trek back in 1993 when it came out. Yeah. They would have felt the same way. At, Very unless well there done. were those unabashed hate whatever is trying to replace what I love right now. <laughs> TOS. I, yeah. I don't like TNG because it's replacing TOS. I don't like TOS because it's replacing TNG or it's not TOS, but DS9. Right. But you know, all, here's all the this. argument. Here's the argument against those haters. TNG had good writing, and so did DS9. Later. I know, I know. It took a couple of years, but even the first two years, there were a couple episodes that were pretty golden. Each Uh, of the first two seasons had some pretty darn good episodes, like Conspiracy was a great first season episode. Sure. Measure of a Man, great second season episode. Uh, What was it, Q-Who, that introduced the Borg? Yep, season two. Set up, set up uh, the best TNG episodes ever. Bra- uh, you know, I, not Brave New World. Best of both worlds. Jesus Christ, what's yes. wrong with me? Brave New World. It's a good book, by the way. But I, it's a good cautionary tale. Read it. Brave New World. Yeah, I read it last year. Good. But. <laughs> um, the fact that they're going with Captain America, Brave New World, just flummoxes me. Jesus Christ. Do they understand what that even references? No, they don't. Captain they have America's no idea. Strange New Worlds with Bucky mm. Barn with the Sebastian Stan being replaced by Anson Mount. Hmm. It might work. It might work. But I they mean, can't be stupid nothing. about it. <laughs> so jumping to by the DS9's way, by, <laughs> I saw a meme today. Um, what was it? It was one of those, uh, it was, it was one of those Facebook, uh, like <laughs> review companies that, that posted a, a meme that was, uh, it was like, uh, oh, spoiler or something. 
anyway, they were like, I watched the, the new movie Civil War and I can't believe what a terrible mess and awful remake it was. They don't even acknowledge the conflict between Cap and Iron Man. Oh, my God. Uh... It wasn't mine. I just saw it. I, I know. Like, oh, nice. My, my parents yeah. saw it, hated it. I saw it's a getting, recap of the whole thing. It's getting trashed across the board. I saw a recap of the whole thing. The whole premise is to glorify the press and saying that the press can be good. Well, yeah, it can, but not in this circumstance. Like, Jesus Christ, the, the press was trying to contribute to the better good, and it wasn't happening. <laughs> and there was a lot of bad things that happened with those people. It just it, non nonsensical. Apparently, the acting is top notch, but like the whole plot is nonsensical. So, yeah, apparently Texas and California are allies. Total. That nonsense. was their that was their attempt to try to make it nonpartisan and and to try Which to focus on the I humanity. Can but yeah, it was. But apparently, like the mid flyover states, all versus, annihilated versus the wall. Are you kidding? I know. I know. I know, I know, I know. And that's that's probably, this is probably not a movie we're ever going to watch, you and I, right? I have no desire to watch it. No, didn't have it. Didn't have an interest. I'm waiting for the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare, which is coming out this weekend. That looks I'm pretty very pretty excited. That looks it does sweet. look pretty sweet. <laughs> With then Queen again, Argyle, playing in the background. Argyle looked pretty sweet too, but apparently it was terrible. But I, I can't wait to see that when it comes out on digital. Anyway. anyway, so Deep Space Nine, we talked about how good Emissary is. How about uh, the series finale? Yeah. What we leave behind. What we leave behind. On the better side of good. Almost great. I thought it was quite it's good. Almost great. Very good. Yes, I will say very good. Almost great. It wrapped up pretty much all the major plot threads of the the show without feeling it, too rushed without feeling too rushed and i will agree with you like they finished the war arc with cardassia they had great stories to you know they had great moments with martok and admiral what's his face and ross captain what's his face and Cisco? Uh, yes thank you uh, <laughs> i'm an equal opportunity forgetter so <laughs> um demar's heroic death yeah, Damar's heroic. By the way, the the story arc with Damar for the last nine episode arc, just wonderful. Like and, you know, and, and Kira wearing a Starfleet uniform because she couldn't represent Bajor. She had to represent Starfleet. Fantastic. Mwah. Just a piece to reset. I love. I loved seeing Kira in the Starfleet uniform. She looked great. It was great. It fit her, and obviously, it was never supposed to fit her. That's the thing. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I, I, I felt that they, they wrapped up the war arc very well, uh, exceedingly well. The It felt a tiny bit rushed, tiny bit rushed with Gul Dukat and Kai Nguyen. Uh, Kai Nguyen. Kai Nguyen. Thank you. And Kai Nguyen. Uh, dealing with the paw rates. It was like, you know, they were, they, they were on the holodeck, you know, listening to... Um, what's his name? Vic Fontaine. Vic Fontaine. Thank you. I bought I bought uh Jimmy Darren's uh uh album of that era. By the way, James Darren. James Darren. Uh, I think they actually call. I think they actually call him Jimmy Darren. The like the the cast and crew and whatnot. So they maybe might. that's a fami- that's a familiar thing if if you're friendly. <laughs> But I bought that album. It's seventeen ep- is seventeen uh, songs. Tracks. It's great tracks. It's fantastic. It's all everything I mean, look, you hear on D F- D Space Nine. But look, look so, at this guy. This guy, you know, knew Sinatra was kind of a, a teen heartthrob. Had had some success, and then, you know, he was kind of in a career lull. You know, singing and acting, and he gets a big boost by playing a hologram holographic. <laughs> A uh, lounge singer from the 1960s yeah. Las Vegas <laughs> on a sci-fi show set. 
millions of light years away. Yeah. 400 years in the future. Yeah. And Why not? Was, and it made sense somehow. It made total sense. <laughs> so he sang his tracks. He sang his tracks on the show over the course of two years, two and a half years, something like that. Two. Something crazy. So <laughs> actually, it was only like a season and a half. He really God, came he, in. And he was he sat back. In. He was on so many times. It felt like he was on longer than that. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, I knew it was like all... after the retake of Deep Space Nine that they introduced mm-hmm. him and everything. But still, anyway, great album. I recommend it. Fantastic. Um, but you know, you, you, they're 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 on they're in the lounge listening to him, and then Cisco gets the note. You know. The premonition from the prophets that he needs to go to Bajor. His mother, I think. His mother notifies him and he has to go. So he goes and he, there's this one final battle between him and Gul Dukat, powered by the paw rates. Eight episodes. And eight episodes. That's it? That is God, it. he was so integral to the whole lat- back end of Deep Space Nine. That feels like yeah. too little. It does, but it, I think another reason why they liked doing that in the finale is that there were a lot of actors who were out of costume and out of makeup yeah. shown in the crowd. Oh, sure. And yeah, crew, that was a good final, finale. Stephen Bear and some of the crew were in there, Yeah, which, which is nice. It's a good tip for them, nice yeah. tip of the hat. And, uh, you know, Cisco, the only downside I have really – is that and it's a it's a franchise thing because Cisco leaves and he still hasn't come back yet. No, I agree. That that, that, felt, that is to me is the biggest loose end in all of Star Trek. That felt wrong. It felt wrong. Um, no two no two if Sarans are about it. I mean, it felt wrong. It was okay. If they were to resolve it with like Voyager or something, or but, a movie, or a movie or something, but no, they didn't do that. Like so. That being said, that's why that's why the finale for Deep Space Nine is almost great. I think right now, though, of all the Star Trek shows, it has the best start and finish. Yes. A uh, solid beginning, solid ending. Yes, absolutely. I'm gonna, Most I'm gonna consistent. give Enterprise a solid beginning. I will agree with that. And if they, you they... take out these are the voyages, Terra Prime and uh, the, that two parter was a pretty good was a pretty good two parter. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I would agree. Where you uh, where you leave off where you have. You know, the humans have, have, you know, have tried to demonstrate that they've pushed past this. And this is just a splinter group that has basically been nullified. And they're still trying to convince all these delegates that working together is for their benefit. Mm-hmm. You know, if they had ended the se- series there, it would have felt a little bit more organic. Yes. But since we can't do that, it has <laughs> the worst finale of a Star Trek show right now. I would. Oh, wait, 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 wait. What was the TOS? That had a finale too, wasn't it? The, yeah. Turnabout Intruder wasn't Turnabout that. Turnabout Intruder, it? where Kirk wasn't even a, a Kirk. Kirk was um, a woman in and, Kirk's and they body. Had like a, and they had a real sexist end. She could have done it if she only she wasn't born a woman or something like that. Yeah, something like that. So like, <laughs> between that and these are the voyages, uh, that's a toss up right now for the worst current finales to a Star Trek show. Shatner talks about that that episode in um, You Can Call Me Bill. He, mm-hmm. <laughs> and the, the acting challenge that that was and saying goodbye to Star Trek at the same time. <laughs> so OK. So I've got two I want to kind of rush through since we're getting towards the end. Mm-hmm. Um, first is Babylon 5. In the beginning, felt so different from even season one. 
the movie with like you were talking the, about. Yeah, the movie, like that that was filmed in like a year and a half before the series came out. So it was a little wonky. The makeup yeah. was inconsistent, obviously. Makeup was inconsistent. A lot of the characters were different. They had, you know, a bunch of different characters who didn't end up making it to the series. You have the lighting was different. It was much darker lighting. There was a lot of like synth music going on. Well, it was always synth, but yeah. Yeah, but but probably more prominent. More heavy. Yeah. Kind of stuff. Um and apparently JMS looking back on it is not happy with it. And then you have the series finale, which is tells the story of Sheridan coming to his end, knowing that his end is coming because he was only given twenty years when he was brought back. Yeah. And um It was it was a, a, a very pretty finale. You know, it tied up some of the. Uh, it left some positivity for the surviving characters. Mm-hmm. And then there was also this very nice dinner scene where some of the surviving B5 members are visiting Sheridan to celebrate, you know, they all, a lot of them, all kind of know why they're there. Yeah. And uh, but they, he wants to get together with his friends one more time, and and you know they're all laughing, telling stories, and then they end up doing toasts to their fallen comrades like Londo and Jakar and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Sheridan goes off to find his destiny. But in the end, there's also a little. Kind of epilogue where all the remaining characters kind of follow uh, to the, you know, what where the series leaves them, but with enough, you know, things to to make it worth it. Mm-hmm. Sleeping in the light. Twenty years after the end of the Shadow War, Sheridan is approaching his end, and decides to gather everyone together one last time but it leaves sheridan kind of becomes one with the force so to speak but it leaves all the others you know ivanova has she has a new lease on life you know garibaldi franklin they all have things that they're doing kind of leaves it with like like that Mm -hmm. rather than leaving leaving it on a there's a little bit of a bittersweet note, but I, I call it a very nice, fitting end to the series. And since they did a time skip, it still left you plenty of room for any of those B5 <laughs> movies that they like. Sure. To do. Yeah. Um, another really good one to talk about is The Clone Wars which the movie was supposed to be like the first few episodes, like the first four episodes or whatever. And there were, (laughs) somebody convinced George Lucas to release it in the theater and it was kind of clunky. You know, they hadn't, I don't think they had fully refined some of the- I would agree with that. I couldn't finish that damn thing. I I tried, I watched the first 45 minutes. It was literally just a bunch of robots and star troopers shooting at, at each other like 50 at a time. With some herky jerky lightsaber fights. Yeah. Now the one advantage that that movie had over the rest of the series is that Samuel L. Jackson and Christopher Lee came back to do their voices of Mace Windu and uh, Count Dooku, respectively. Mm-hmm. So not great. Nope. Uh, made you a little worried when they launched the series, but then like then, you know, they had once like after like the first couple episodes, then they get into the malevolence arc, and then they're doing arcs. Of, then it really picked up. And yeah, the first season was uneven as many first seasons of TV shows are, but each progressive season got better. And season seven, the 
last four parts. It was basically a movie running concurrently with Revenge of the Sith, The Siege of Mandalore, and Order 66 was breathtaking, heartbreaking, and beautiful all at once. A beautiful finish to a well-loved and very impactful TV show. Sure. Would agree with that. You know, I <laughs> we we we've gone over this even <laughs> we we, a year we went ago. On, on on the Clone Wars ending and everything. But, it, but it's just it's just so hard not to admit it. It was a phenomenal finale. Sure, absolutely. That this one it's might actually have the biggest disparity from start to finish. Opening. Yeah, terrible opening, phenomenal ending. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Completely agree. And the opposite was Battlestar Galactica, which had a phenomenal opening and kind of a Game of thrones type ending. I would say that they were... I wouldn't... Uh, hmm. I would say kind of Game of thrones You're right, where they had a lot of loose ends and they just kind of hodgepodge it together. But it was still a little bit more consistent than what we had with Game of Thrones. You're right. I think if maybe they didn't even do the tack they got a on too in smart the 21st for themselves. century. I mean, no, that, it, that brought it, it all together because we would have needed the audience needed that payoff. The audience needed the payoff of what was related to Earth and what wasn't, like our Earth. So. Well, when, once they did a landfall on Earth and it would, turned out to be like whatever it was, early Homo sapiens, mm-hmm. you already could see the, the, the general current formation of the continents when they approached it. They're like, oh, but they're like two million years or like a million years in the past <laughs> or something like that. It's like, okay, they could have left it at that with them going off to settle and whatnot. I'm going to look this up now. That being said, that that last part was the thing that riled some people. Uh, but overall, I mean, I think most people hoped that they were going to reach like Earth and it was going to be like today level Earth or something like that. I was hoping that it wasn't. I was hoping that Earth would be like super powered or something. I did not want like a present day Earth versus, you know, they did that in 1980. <laughs> Well, I didn't know that that even existed back, you know, back at when that when the sh- series ended. But um okay, here we go. We're seeing we're seeing the daughter between the Cylon and what's his face walking. And then Hera. she looks at the stars, Hera. And then it's going to skip to Hilo and Athena's daughter. Yes, thank you for those words. I'm waiting for the how many years later. And it's not doing it. They're taking their sweet time. Still taking their sweet time. Oh, now we're in New York. 150,000 years later. Oh. So they landed 150,000 years. Right in the sweet spot where humanity had been fully formed. uh, As Homo sapiens had been around for at least 50,000 years per the fossil record. And these other humans get introduced along with the mitochondrial uh, Eve. Mm -hmm. Which still don't understand the importance of mitochondrial Eve. Apparently we're all parts I want. I get it. I mean, yeah, that was the implication, but, um, I felt it was satisfying that they found Earth and they were like, it was a little weird that they're like, you know what? We're not going to recreate our our issues. We're not going to build cities. We're just going to get rid of all technology and stuff. Like, after all you fought for, you're just going to say, we're going to just cave it out, man. (laughs) We're going to get rid of all our tech. We're going to learn on our own. Like, you fought so hard to protect your humanity and now you're just going to throw it away? Like... They weren't fighting to protect their technology. They were just fighting to protect their race. 
I mean, yeah, but there was no guarantee. I mean, there was a sort of guarantee because they had never come across a planet that was so biologically diverse and prolific, as as Od- Adama said to, uh, uh, near the end there. Doc, um, you got a one-track mind. <laughs> There's that, too. But, uh, you know, it was just one of those things. I, I, I found it satisfying. It was... But it can never be a great ending if you have to go online to find explanations for said ending. Like, how is Starbucks still alive if she was dead? Oh, no, online I found out she was an angel. Like, they never explained it in the thing. She met a red priestess who rose her from the dead. She did not. You know this. (laughs) But so she was apparently an angel, you know, speaking, speaking the word of God. And, you know, you know, bless Ronald D. Moore for actually going a very religious route. Um, to so just say we and all. The hand of God, you know, was what guided humanity to be who we are today, 150,000 years ago from a different star system. <laughs> so, you know, based off of the 12 um, constellations, the. The 12 colonies of Cobol. 12 colonies, 12 colonies of Cobol, uh, off of named after the constellations and everything like that. So who knows? I mean, it, it was a fun little fling. I, I didn't walk away pissed about it. So <laughs> I, I didn't either, but I also felt it didn't quite hit the mark. Could have been a little better. I could have been a little better. Yes. So. (laughs) So what do you think? Do we did we. uh, Do we do good? I think we do good. I think. um, I think we covered all the big ones that we needed to cover tonight. So (laughs) that's the important part. We got all the Star Treks except for the original. <laughs> we mentioned and it very briefly. Mostly briefly. just Turnabout Intruder. Yes. Uh, we got Babylon 5. We had... Oh, we didn't talk about Space Above, Above and Beyond. But, oh well. That we didn't have that like later. a true finale, though, some of these. That no, just ended. It, yeah, so that's probably why. These were these were all shows that were meant to end. So that that's a good point. Or at least had a chance to have a series finale. <laughs> Yes, exactly. So, all right. Well, I feel I feel satisfied with this. Anything else, DT? Uh, no. All I right. I think we're good. We well, might we that... might do another version later on, but right now we've nailed the high points. <laughs> and on that note, everyone, you guys keep dreaming. So long. I'm PS McKay. It's out there. And I'm DT Calfman. And I'll see you up on the high ground. Oh, I'm sorry. Buy my book, too, on Amazon. Hey, hey, Stranger, Strangeling Chronicle. Yep. Make sure you write the second part in, the strange, the, the Changeling Chronicle. Otherwise, you might get the wrong thing. No, Hey, Stranger comes up. It's fine. <laughs> Don't Google it. No, look on Amazon. Look on Amazon. Hi guys, this is an independent broadcast by Alpha Site Productions, produced by DT Cabman and PS McKay. Music courtesy of Camtasia. For more information on upcoming episodes, follow PS McKay on X at PS McKay, or go to thosesci guys.com for past episode information.